Good morning. How are you guys? Well, welcome back to our second day. Welcome to the 2014 Technology Exchange. I hope you had a wonderful Monday, a great evening. Hope you enjoyed the winter circle and also that you spend some time socializing, talking with your colleagues, making new colleagues, and collaborating with everybody. And I uh, hope you had a lot of fun. I did with the first uh, robotics teams. Weren't they great? <laughs> so I'm only here for a little bit. We have another great award and recognition to do this morning. It's part of the Diversity Awards that, as I mentioned yesterday, are in an effort to recognize emerging IT women and early career professionals and their attendance at these type of events. So it is with great pleasure that I would like to introduce Clara Yelinkova, who is a member of the Internet 2 Board of Trustees and also the current chair of Uncommon Steering. Thank you. Clara? Thank you, Anna. Um, thank you. Um, so it is with great pleasure that I get to in introduce this award, uh, but mainly to introduce the person after whom this award is named, Carrie Ragenstein. So what, what most of you may not know is, I know that many of you have benefited from Carrie's leadership and commitment to development over the years, but I have benefited. So probably the most, I think, of anybody, and because I needed the most help when I was at Wisconsin, I was still kind of a cantankerous sysadmin with a attitudinal issues. Uh, but Carrie groomed me, I think, to a point where I am now a CIO at the University of Chicago. So thank you, Carrie. Please come on stage. And in recognition oh, of, of um, many, here is a, a plaque oh, in my. your honor. Wow, thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> thank you, wow. Well, now we specialize in cantankerous CIOs. But <laughs> thank you, Clara. You That's it. There you are. Uh, and, and thank you, Internet2, for this wonderful honor. Uh, I have always considered it a gift to be part of higher education because together we support the development of new communities and also the, uh, the advancement of scholarship. Ours is a team sport, so I would like to thank the many wonderful people in In Common with whom I have the pleasure and privilege to work. You are the very, very patient people who taught me about identity management, and you are the very talented professionals who actually made In Common a reality. Think about it. Ten years ago, in common served zero end users. Today, in common serves eight million users. As I said, together we support the development of communities and the advancement of scholarship. You are also now the very thoughtful leaders who are working very hard to ensure that our own community is as inclusive and diverse as possible, and that is what's going to provide for a successful future. So everyone, thank you again so much. Thank you, Carrie. And uh, now in recognition of Carrie's work, uh, I I'm pleased to recognize our first inaugural winner of uh, this award. Please come on board. Jamie McHugh is the Academic Computing and Network Services Coordinator at Colorado State University. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. Fantastic. Here's your award. Anna and Shell, are you coming here so we can take the picture? Where's Shell? Oh, come on, man. Yes, we are on schedule. We're letting men up here. So. Right. Sorry, I'm the laggard. Yeah. We're the tall ones, so remember. Where is, who's taking the picture? Someone taking the picture. Yeah. Oh. We're all both. Wow. Wow. Do you want to powder? Do you need to powder your nose first? No. Uh, okay. Okay. okay all right. All right. We're ready. We're ready. One more. That's enough. That, that's good. <laughs> all right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.
Please welcome VP of Network Services, Ron Vitsky. Well, good morning. Um, congratulations, Carrie and Jamie. Uh, it's just you know great to have a chance to honor your work and the work to come too. So, so congratulations. Um, we have a spectacular panel this morning that's going to talk about um, uh, three really interesting projects that are going on on top of the Internet 2 network. Um, and then we have a closing tech talk that, um, that models some really interesting simulations that I think you'll, you'll really enjoy um, watching this morning. I want to start out, though, by just giving a little bit of context about a couple of things that are going on um, with the network itself kind of underpinning some of these activities. Uh, many of you remember that uh, just a short number, four years ago, in fact, someone said to me last night, five years of hell ago, um, we were all in the middle of this BTOP thing, and Internet 2, uh, along with many of you, um, have spent the last years building these incredible new networks to support the community. Um, in Internet 2's case, we received this $100 million grant, and we said, boy, if we're going to have that kind of investment in the Internet 2 network, what can we do to make sure um, that that investment sets us out in front for years to come and reestablishes uh, the Internet 2 research and education agenda as uh, a network as um, a network that provides tip of the sphere capabilities for innovation for our whole community. Um, and so we tried, we assembled a number of groups, a number of folks from throughout this room and throughout other places in the community to talk about what innovations had worked in the past. Um, or what, what technologies and what uh, practices we had used in the pack to support innovation um, that had led to some of the great successes in the RE community. And we came up with these three basic principles. Um, one, that we needed to build a network that was about abundant bandwidth again, that we would no longer constrain ourselves to small pipes, and we would do everything we could to encourage massive adoption of 100 gig and beyond technologies in our new platform. Um, two, that uh, the, the, some of the greatest innovations that happened in our community happened very early on, 25 years ago, when people had the ability to actually affect the network stack and to integrate it and change the network stack to do di different things to support their applications. Um, so we talked about having deep programmability in the network as something that was really essential coming out of the rebuild. Um, and finally, that you know, support for data-intensive science has always led applications development in our community. And so supporting things like the work that ESNet um, has done just an awesome job with, with Science DMZ, and thinking about other things that um, would support data-intensive science in our community was, was something we wanted to be very intentional about. Um, about two years ago, uh, two, two, two states, two state networks and their associated universities, led first by Ohio and very quickly thereafter by Indiana, um, began a group that, that eventually became over 25 campuses that committed to implement all three of these aspects of, um, of, in, of our, what we've called our innovation platform and move us back out um, to the front. We think that has been successful, and we've got a couple of uh, interesting announcements for you today to talk about the progress we've made. Um, first of all, in September of this year, we set, unsurprisingly, yet another record um, for adoption of abundant bandwidth in our community. Um, just as an idea, you know, it, 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 we, we've had steady growth um, for many years, but this year was really a breakout year in terms of adoption, mainly because so many of those 100 gig connections are coming to fruition, support from the CCINE and other programs in NSF, um, and just the amount of time it takes for, to, to push 100 gigs so deep into the campus and into, into the labs where the work is happening. So we hit 61.79 petabytes last month on our IP network alone. This is not measuring all the things we do on, on AL2S um, or on layer one waves or anything, but 62 petabytes on the IP network um, is a pretty impressive stat. Um, in, in context, CERN in 2012 moved 25 petabytes in the entire year out of the LHC to other, other places, according to one site. Um, another site uh, statistic I saw was that Netflix's source data, not all the derivations for the different formats they use, um, but Netflix's source data for all the video libraries they have is three petabytes. So on the Internet 2 network, we moved 62 petabytes last month. We're on track um, to, uh, to break that record again this month, sometime later this week. Um, there's a showcase session about the record and um, uh, some neat little um, uh, opportunities for the community to engage um, Wednesday, tomorrow at 3.30 in the community showcase upstairs and down the hallway. I'd all encourage you to, to go to that. Um, and there's some opportunity to also look at some of the analytics um, that we have um, as well. 
Uh, just, just a little bit about you know, the curve and the traffic adoption. One of the other things that's, that's been great to see in the last year is that this is science data. When we look at what's happening on the Internet 2 network, the bulk of it um, is not Netflix and YouTube. But in fact, um, it's grid computing, research activities, storage, FTP, and collaboration. These are exactly the things we want an abundant bandwidth network um, to be able to be used for. Um, and you know, even if you look at some of the other stats, things like Netflix, which dominates the commercial inter uh, internet, is just a small portion of what we're doing um, in the Internet 2 community. So these are all great stats. They show adoption and growth, and that the abundant bandwidth strategy is playing out, and people are beginning to take advantage of it. Um, Advanced Layer 2 service has been the, the underpinning of our innovation platform strategy. We've had great growth here. Number of users, number of VLANs created per month um, are growing. Uh, you know, again, very intentional here about the three strategies. One of the other things I added on this slide um, is the other thing people said is if you're going to build a network that's built exclusively on OpenFlow, which this network is, um, you've got to promise us that this will be pr production quality. Um, and so we've done a lot of work in the two years that this network has been in production. Um, it, it's a tribute to the team at Indiana and on the Internet 2 staff um, that they've been able to make such a great production network with such a, a new technology. Um, so a little bit about that. You know, this, this uh, very unique nationwide 100 gigabit um, open flow based network. Uh, here's an example of the last four months of incidents in our network impairments. And these aren't necessarily outages because um, many of you have redundancy strategies, and so do we, um, that, that tend to work. But 87 hours of impairment due to fiber cuts and layer one outages, okay? Um, 13 hours of impairments due to hardware cards going bad. Zero minutes, zero seconds of SDN-related outages in that period of time. So, you know, forwarding is working, the network's working, the open flow uh, provisioning stack has proven um, uh, to, be, to be at least as reliable and more so than a lot of the other uh, pieces of the stack. So the second announcement this morning is something that we've promised for some time. Um, we've been running an open flow network for ourselves now for two years. Um, but today we can announce that we have a network virtualization component that makes that open flow stack available to you. Um, what you can think about this is an opportunity for the community to build or to take advantage of a nationwide 100 gigabit open flow slice that can be an extension of your campus network, of your research project, et cetera. Essentially, we're giving you the same programmable control as if you went out and bought uh, a nationwide fiber network, um, a nationwide set of uh, open flow switches and provision them and did all the interconnection. Simply by calling us and saying, I'd like a slice that has the ability to have, let's say, 50 VLANs and 200 flow insertions per second. Basic capability, exposure of an open flow layer. Um, this is multi-tenancy for networking. Um, so for those of you that are sysadmins that have been working with um, VMs for many, many years, you know, you know that we've done uh, virtualization on networks way up the stack in MPLS and VLANs and other things. This pushes it way down and makes that capability available for those of you that have the need to actually program your own flow rules. Um, or to integrate you know, your network operating system right up into your application. So we're really excited about this capability. Um, every one of the nodes on the network is running this, and we'll talk about some um, examples uh, that, that other parts of the community are beginning to adopt the same software. Um, we've got some global extension conversations underway. So truly, you're going to have an environment where if you want to build your own custom network stack, um, you will be able to do that. This morning, there was a demonstration that Eric and a number of others led. Um, where Florida International University, Max University of Maryland, University of Utah, and Internet2 um, did a demonstration of this network virtualization layer where each one of those four organizations um, were able to run their own uh, SDN-defined uh, networking controller against their, their network, but they were also able to run a shared controller against their networks in a different slice. Um, so, you know, if you think about implementing virtual organizations in our community, and we have a lot of virtual organizations, um, this is an opportunity for, you know, multiple administrative domains, multiple ownership domains um, to uh, give up a piece, of, a slice of their network and make it use, useful to others across the community. So, really interesting um, demonstration this morning. Last week at the uh, Genie Conference, um, 
We demonstrated the Genie Learning Switch. Again, um, a, a very unique um, application running in its own slice. Both of these demonstrations, of course, happened while the production network is moving that 63 petabytes of data across, across the network. So we're just really excited about the capabilities this offers, not for us, um, but for you. You know, this, is, this, this virtualization stage is about um, making our network programmable by the community again. Uh, we don't have ambition that you know, 5,000 people are going to write their own network operating system here. Um, but we'd be delighted um, if a handful of you uh, and the projects you're working on decided that you wanted to take advantage of this capability. Um, so, you know, again, uh, this is about enabling you to do things. It's kind of the last piece of the innovation platform uh, strategy that we started several years ago. And um, I guess I didn't invite my, advance my slide while I was talking about this. Um, we, we, we think it's really just a unique um, a capability that all of you uh, may want to take advantage of. So with that and those two quick announcements, just you know, highlighting the, the growth and adoption of the, of the strategy and um, the capabilities that we're introducing, I'm really delighted to have a chance to um, invite Craig Matsumoto of SDN Central to come up to moderate a panel that's going to talk about some of the great things the community is doing on top of this network. Yeah, I skipped one slide. Great. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, can come on up, guys. I'll, uh talk as you walk through. Yeah, my name is Craig Matsumoto. I'm managing editor with SDN Central. I've been covering SDN since kind of the moderately early days, like 2011. So that makes me a grizzled, grizzled veteran of, of, of the scene, I guess. Um, Rob had an interesting idea. My, my world is basically networking. So I'm curious, how many of you out there consider yourselves networking people? So if I talk layer two, layer three, you, you like that? Okay. Of those, how many of you are coders too? Who's written a line of code in the last, say, three, four weeks? Quite a few. Okay. Just curious. Okay, great. Well, hopefully you'll get a lot out of this talk. We're going to talk about uh, some of the uses of, of the network, of this fancy new SDN stuff and the, the virtualization capability that Rob just talked about. And, and all this is important because it's, it's for the, the applications and the uses. That, that's why we're doing all this networking stuff and trying to transform the network and make it a little more flexible, a little easier to use. So I'm going to introduce the panelists uh, first. and. They'll kind of hand off the, the, the slides to one another. We're going to start with Steve Corbato, who is with the University of Utah. He's the uh, interim CIO there, an adjunct faculty member, and used to run Internet 2 back in the day. The network. The network. The network. <laughs> Not the people, the network. Bill Snow is Doug with... <laughs> Bill Snow is with OnLab, the Open Networking Laboratory. He's a VP of Engineering there. And uh, he'll be followed by Larry Peterson, also with, uh, with OnLab. He's the chief architect. So why don't we start with you, Steve? You're going to talk a little bit about SDN requirements. Got a little technology malfunction here. In, in thinking about Craig's uh, uh, survey that he just did, you didn't ask about overhead. And I feel like I'm overhead at this meeting. but. Uh, what I want to do is talk a little bit about, uh, I think, basically three things. The first of which is a set of requirements that I think, uh, particularly from a, a one interim CIO's perspective, um, our, our campus uh, networks need to start meeting. Secondly, I want to take a little bit of a Utah perspective and, and explain why supporting this type of research is important to our campus, a little bit of a historical perspective. And finally, I want to talk about some of the ways that, that our central IT organization is collaborating with other, other entities on our campus, especially our, our School of Computing, to support this research. So, so if I look at, at how the networks, uh, essentially, if I write on a napkin what our top challenges are right now for, for managing our network, I, I think back to uh, an early joint text that I attended uh, 15 years ago at New Mexico State in Las Cruces in uh, um, 1999. And, and I don't think this list is that different in terms of at least what's on the list. You know, wireless technologies were just coming out in 1999. But, you know, we had security and privacy concerns, maybe not so much on the, on the privacy side, but certainly security. Uh, we, we were struggling. How do we support our, our, our our, our scientists, our computational scientists who, who are trying to move data at that time either from telescopes or, or NSF high performance computing centers. People were expecting the network to work more and more. Um, it, the management complexity was growing. 
Um, and, and I think it, we probably weren't using that phrase at the time, but we certainly say now technical debt. Um, Non-decisions have a cost. A failure to upgrade has a cost. Um, so, but I would say now the scale of these issues has changed. Uh, you can add a few more nines to the availability expectations. Uh, when I talk about privacy concerns and I talk about our health sciences uh, center, uh, the, the number I use there is if we have a, a breach of privacy, we start at a million dollars and we multiply by $100 for every individual affected. So easily getting up to two, three, four million dollars. Um, that's a lot of damage that our networks can cause or, or the failure to secure them. So let me make a couple of observations, I think, where we are. Um, in talking with CIOs now, uh, there's no question that this is about the services. The infrastructure needs to be seamless. It needs to be in the back room. It's really what can you do for us with, with a highly available, reliable, and also a, a, a very customized user interface for a service. One of the points that we're making around our campus as we look at a, at a major redesign right now is we have to overlay the traditional campus network infrastructure that's based on geography and organization with one that's now based on role, function, and risk. And we think this is an area where SDN really can help. Um, the, a, a paradox here, um, just as we're, uh, thanks to NetPlus and, and other, other cloud services, we're moving more and more services out to the commercial sector that makes the network more important than ever. And, and, and especially areas of ownership and management and, and particularly reliability. If the network goes down, the whole system goes down. Um, a, a, a fourth point here, and, and I, this is a shout out to Ken Klingenstein and his crowd. Um, finally, after 15 years, I get it. Identity services could be even more important than the network itself, especially when, when, when used in support of SDN. Yeah, yeah, I, I was wrong, Ken. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and finally, I think this is very important. I hope you get a sense of this from, from my, my later slides. We're seeing much greater overlap now between the network research community and the computational science community. So if I were to, at, a, at an SDN workshop, or you know, I'd say I'd probably put these up, um, requirements like this uh, up on, on in, in front of that group trying to say what, what, what we really need and whether SDN does it or a subsequent technology, our, our needs are, are, are still the same. We have got to segment our networks. Uh, we need to separate uh, the high performance uh, requirements and, and certainly NSF has provided and ESNet have provided great leadership here uh, with the science DMC concept. But in my mind, that's just really one, one network zone. Uh, uh, but we, we have to segment our protected information. Um, it's, not just, it's not just things subject to HIPAA. Uh, we, we, we understand that educational <coughs> records are, are going to come under gr greater uh, uh, privacy expectations, uh, certainly in terms of penalties. We've got to get that, those devices out. We also have to think about vulnerable devices uh, that may be running older op operating systems and can't be upgraded, but our scientists refuse to turn them off. And finally, we need a high re reliability environment. Um, for example, uh, we have, we have uh, uh, environmental monitoring on all our, our, our refrigerators supporting our biospecimens. Um, if those get hot, uh, lots, you know, uh, decades, year of decades of research can be, can be destroyed. Um, we, need, we need to be tied, we need the network very closely tied to the Identity Access Management Service. That means the Identity and Access Management Service needs to be as reliable as the network. We need centralized and scalable device management. We have, you know, uh, um, uh, multiple thousands of devices in our network now. We have to be able to manage these centrally. We have to have consistent configuration. We have to have checking. Uh, we've got to support the installed base. Good old legacy IPv4 and IPv6. And most importantly from a CIO perspective, we need lower total cost of ownership. Um, and and if, I, I think if you were to take a poll of CIOs and, and, and ask them if they knew anything about SDN, they would know one phrase, and that's merchant silicon. Whether, whether we actually have an opportunity now to get commodity uh, hard switching hardware out there and then have centralized management and really lower the cost of, of these systems. So let me talk a little bit about why this is important to my university. Um, uh, Ed Lazowska, who's the Bill and Melinda Gates Chair of Computer Science at the University of Washington, taught me a very important phrase about 20 years ago when I got in this phrase. And, and, and I think it may be a fundamental computer science principle. Got to be a dot on the map. Um, uh, that was important in Seattle. It's certainly important in Salt Lake City, and we're very thankful that we had two 
computer science researchers in the late 1960s, David Evans and Ivan Sutherland, who were pioneers in, in the emerging field of computer graphics at the time, who, who had, had a computer, a PDB-10, that was ready to go on, on a new network known as the ARPANET. So, so Utah at that point became the first dot on the ARPANET map, map outside of the state of California. If you look at, at how the ARPANET evolved, I would argue that Utah was one of the few nodes in a flyover state. The concentration of nodes was uh, mostly on the east and west coast, no insult to Urba the metropolis of Urbana-Champaign, Illinois, with that comment, or, or Pittsburgh, Gary. Um, but the, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but this is a critical, you know, and this tells us as a university that if we want to be on a dot in the map, or <coughs> a, a dot in the map, we got to be early on in the game. So uh, an example of that is, is the Internet 2 network that Rob just described. Uh, we've been involved in discussions around that network uh, uh, since, I think, probably 1998. Uh, we understand we're in a very important fiber junction in the west. Um, essentially, uh, Salt Lake City, if you look at the maps, uh, the, our metro area is the gateway to Seattle, uh, Bay Area, and LA. And if you look at the traffic maps, um, most of that traffic uh, flows through our area. That might explain why the National Security Ag Agency decided to put a small data center in our valley. Uh, they, they are not connected to the Internet 2 network, I need to emphasize. Um, <laughs> yet. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the key point here is we're one of the few four-way nodes in the network, um, along with Houston and, and, and Chicago, and, and we understand that this is a critical point in the network infrastructure, and, and we, we value our relationship with Internet 2 and being able to support connectivity to our region. So, look, so uh, I've talked about the importance to our campus. So let me talk about how we implement it at Utah. And we're a great believer in, partner, in partnerships. As I say, Utah is 1% of the US population. If we don't, if we don't partner, uh, we're not going to get very far. So our campus partnership has four components. The first is, is the network research group, uh, the, 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 what historically has been known as, as the flex group, uh, that's now led by uh, professors Kobus van der Roy, uh, Rob Ricci, and Eric Eide. Uh, this is in the School of Computing. We are looking to add a new uh, uh, computing security group that's just in the process of growing that department <coughs> into this collaboration. We work with the computational scientists through the, the uh, long-standing Campus Research Computing Center, the Center for High Performance Computing. We bring the production in network in in two ways. We have essentially the, our, our infrastructure group, which has a network group. They also have an access management services. But we also bring our security folks in at the outset. Our security folks are partners in this exercise. You know, I once read uh, about five years ago, you can't go to war now without lawyers. Um, you, can't, you can't do things in networking without your security groups. And then we have a great uh, long-standing state education network in Utah, UEN, uh, that runs our optical network, uh, that gets, enables us to get out to Internet 2, and also uh, provides a lot of advanced services for us. Um, finally, we believe in external partnerships. We need to acknowledge Internet 2 as a partner. Um, we, we work with our State Department of Transportation, and we're part of, of, of both the ACI REF and the Cloud Lab national collaborations. You, some, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if anybody will talk about ACI REF, but that's an attempt to federate uh, campus computing centers uh, under the leadership of Jim Bottom at Clemson. We'll talk more about Cloud Lab. So I want to talk about three projects uh, that we have underway. All have NSF support, um, and, and we couldn't do them without NSF, so I need, I need to thank them but they're all using a basic SDN-based uh, technology uh, that has been developed out of our school of computing over the last 15 years. Uh, originally known as Emulab, in the Genie context, it's known as Protogenie. Essentially, Emulab gives, gives researchers the ability to do virtualized experiments um, over systems and networks in a reproducible way. Um, the, first, the first project here is an NSF CCNIE project where, where we're actually building out our science DMZ using Emulab, rather than putting in our SDN test bed behind the, the, the science DMZ, we're actually using that technology to build it out. This is a partnership with, with uh, uh, Rob Ricci's group. Um, we're also extending this to our honors college. We have a new um, residence hall for our honors students and, and essentially allowing them to connect to the science DMZ. You can imagine our security folks were interested in that one. The second project is apt. Again, this, this is, was, was essentially an attempt to take this to the next level. This is essentially a cluster uh, 
that, that can, can do two things. It can serve not only as a network research test bed, but it also can serve as a computational science cluster. These are traditionally two separate uses of clusters. Uh, the, the, the special sauce here is a, a new software programmable switch by Mellanox that is, is uh, configurable either as, as Ethernet for ports or, or on an individual basis or um, InfiniBand. Um, so, so this, uh, again, this is based on Emulab Protogeny um, and is a good segue to the third uh, project here, which is Cloud Lab, which was just funded under the NSF Cloud program um, in the last few months. This, here the partnership has expanded to include three other universities, Wisconsin, Clemson, and UMass Amherst, as well as uh, uh, BBN Technologies and US Ignite. So the idea of this is, again, starting on that substrate of, of virtualization technology with Emulab and mixing in the science DMZs concept as well as the Internet 2 AL2S uh, service that Rob just described. Um, building that, essentially putting hardware out there at multiple locations for open cloud computing innovation and development. Uh, I, I, uh, I was on a panel for NSF about a year and a half ago and we looked at, at the environment, how cloud computing was evolving. It was mostly behind uh, corporate proprietary walls. If you, you know, Google has been good, for, uh, us and Facebook, they both published papers um, a, uh, about their cloud environments, but in terms of the actual ability to innovate, to, to understand what's, what's inside, what, what the knobs are, are set at, what, what, the, what the, the counters are at, you can't tell that in this current environment. Um, so essentially, Cloud Lab is, is an attempt to give the research community the ability to build their own clouds. You can build, as in this model, you can see clouds built on top of clouds. And, and trying to uh, uh, forge that kind of, of collaboration across the community. Cloud Lab is gonna put hardware at three locations. Um, initially uh, at, at Wisconsin, Clemson, and Utah. Um, we're, we're, we're putting servers out from, and, 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 and uh, switches from three different vendors across the collaboration, Cisco, Dell, and HP. The U Utah collaboration will be running at OpenFlow 1.3, and that may be something we discuss later. Um, just, uh, just to conclude about Cloud Lab, it's already federated with Genie, so if you have a Genie account, you can, you can, you can, we'll be able to get onto Cloud Lab with the same credentials and vice versa. Uh, there's a technology preview already available if you go to the website uh, that'll give at the end. Uh, we expect to be open to early adoption and, and generally uh, by the end of the year and uh, in early next year in general availability. So with that, I'd like to conclude uh, the couple websites that I've cited. Uh, feel free to send me an email. And as I was putting this talk together, I thought about two people that have been very influential who aren't with us anymore. But uh, uh, many things they said as ideas that struck me as crazy 10 to 15 years ago, I'm now reciting as dogma, so I thought I should honor them. Okay, Up next, we've got Bill Snow from uh, OnLab. Vice President of Engineering. Thanks, Craig. It's an honor to be here with uh, so many innovative people, people who are changing the world. I wish I could see you, but uh, I can't. Um, and today, if I can get the slide up, okay. We're gonna talk uh, about how Owen, Owen Lab and Internet2 are working together to accelerate uh, true SDN adoption. Okay, so first, I'd, I'd like to just talk a little bit about what Owen Lab is. First, we're, we're a nonprofit development organization, and I put emphasis on development here because many people think that we're, we're a research organization, and of course we do some research, but fundamentally, we're all about development and creating open source software for the, for the benefit of the public. Our mission is to bring openness and innovation to the internet and cloud for the public good. We're a small team. We've, we've been going for a couple of years now. We have to have a real good focus on who our customers are. We can't be all things to all people. And the first customer for us is a service provider. So what's a service provider vision? A network IT-like. So what, do, what does that really mean? Uh, fundamentally, less complex. Right? Uh, today's control and configuration is, is pretty complex. There's too many protocols. There's too many management interfaces. Operationally, it'd be great if we could have commodity parts replacement and uh, be able to swap out switches or servers more easily. Be able to quickly change configuration in 
maybe seconds and minutes rather than hours, days, weeks. It'd be nice if we could have hardware and software that wasn't so dependent and be able to upgrade each of them on their own basis and allow each of them to follow their own innovation cycles. It's all about applications, and I think it's important to make applications, to give them a better environment, make it easier to build, deploy, and use applications. And finally, installation, monitoring, upgrades, debugging, all need to be simplified. How long is this gonna take? I have people that tell me, well, this is gonna take five or 10 years in service providers. Well, what, what enables this change? True SDN is what enables it. In True SDN, you have a separation of the control and data. The control plane is lifted out of your data plane. It allows you to have innovation cycles in hardware and software that are independent. It allows you to use merchant silicon in your data plane and lets you use commodity servers for your control plane. It brings much better abstractions. Abstractions hide complexity makes it easier for applications, for example, to use the network. Also helps ease migration if you've been able to abstract away the details of some of the lower level protocols. And centralized control brings many opportunities, many new capabilities, opportunities to ease operations, and potentially better security. So how do we bring this vision to life? We do it by partnering with like-minded people. Okay, Internet2 and OnLab is a really important partnership. Between the Internet2 and the campuses that are involved with the Internet2, we have an open flow WAN. We have really great open flow switches. Now we have virtualization to take advantage of that backbone. And I think most important is that we have a community of open-minded people. OnLab brings open source software in the form of virtualization, first with Flowvisor, now with its follow-on, which is called OpenVertex, in network control with our open network operating system, and with help for campus migration, uh, with features that are part of Onos, as well as an application that we call SDNIP. Internet2, campuses, and Owen Lab together will bring this vision to life. And it'll be in much less than five to 10 years. Okay, let's talk a little more about Onos. Isn't it just a research project? I hear this all the time. Isn't it just research? No, <laughs> it's not. Onos has been purpose built for service providers, which means it started with uh, fundamental requirements for high availability, for scale, and for performance. It brings with it innovative northbound abstractions and APIs, okay, northbound being your application interface. A couple of them are global network view as well as application intents. At the southbound, where you're controlling devices, we have plug-in capabilities so that you can use open flow or, or new protocols or you can use your legacy protocols to control devices. And it wouldn't be very meaningful uh, to me anyways, if we weren't doing real use cases with Onos. And so we have a partnership that has focused on real service provider use cases. And we'll be open source soon. Okay, so what's different? So at Onos, it's very important for us to focus on the hardest problem first, solve that. And what, what is that? Okay, so applications running on a controller put a lot of demand on it. Huge number of path setups, for example, maybe a million path setups per second. Um, in addition, the network is, has always got changes going on, and you have to be able to re respond very quickly to those changes on the order of 10 to milliseconds, 10, 10 to 100 milliseconds. It's very fast. Okay, keeping track of that network state, it's a lot of network state, up to a terabyte of network state. And you have to do all of that while remaining highly available. It's a really, really, really hard problem. But it's solvable. And architecture is key. If you don't start with architecture, you won't get there. So what's the Onos architecture look like? 
It starts by running as a multi-instance cluster, which enables high availability and scale out. It has northbound abstractions for global network view and application intents. It has a distributed core and that enables some of these trade-offs that you get with HA scale and performance, and it's protocol independent. And it's a southbound that insulates it with its plug-in architecture, being able to take open flow or legacy. Let's talk a little bit more about the application intent framework. What this framework allows is, is an application to specify a high-level intent, to say what, the, what it wants to do, rather than trying to say how it should do it. Those intents are compiled into actionable objectives, which are then installed into the environment. So for example, a host-to-host -host connection or host-to-host -host intent would compile into two one-way path intents. The resources required by those objectives are then monitored. So for example, a link could go down. In that case, the intent subsystem reacts by compiling those intents and reinstalling revised objectives. A little more look at the distributed core. And again, this is really the key for getting the HA scale out and performance. The state data is not all the same. You have to be able to treat different types of state data differently. You have to look at the size of the data the read-write access patterns, and the consistency that you need for that data. And what we do is we use the appropriate distribution and replication methods that's optimized for each, of, each type of data. OK, so interesting project, but does it really support use cases? Here are four that we're working on. In use case one, we're using Onos to uh, control multi-layer network. So it's in, in control of IP and optical and being able to optimize for both of those layers together. Use case two is one that helps you get started with SDN or migrate to SDN by allowing an SDN island to connect to the existing internet using BGP. In use case three, we take advantage of central offices that uh, many of the pro providers have to provide network functions as a service. And Lurie is going to talk some more of the, about this. And then use case four, again, is another type of migration scenario. It has Onos controlling an MPLS network using segment routing. And that has been done in conjunction with the Open Network Foundation. Talk a little bit more about the SDN IP for external networks. So in this case, we have the SDN IP application, which peers through BGP with the routers and the internet. Through that, it learns the routes. It submits route intents to Onos. Through those intents, the data plane gets programmed. So from all intents and purposes, it looks like another AS to the rest of the system. And this capability can be used to scale SDN islands as well. Here's a picture of the planned deployment that we have with Internet2. We run an Onos cluster with a highly available SDN IP application. It provides L3 connectivity between six universities around the US. So we'll be using SDN switches in the core, no expensive routers. Onos and SDN IP control the network. And we're just starting a testing of this. We haven't been able to develop all of this by ourselves at Owen Lab. We have a very strong partnership with some very well-known uh, industry organizations, service providers, as well as vendors. And they're helping us make Onos and SD and IP a reality. In closing, the Internet2 and Owen Lab is a really important partnership. Internet2 brings an open flow backbone. Campuses bring the communities. ON Lab is bringing SDI, SDNIP and ONOS, and together we're going to make this vision a reality. Accelerating to SDN. Thank you very much.
Okay, great. And last, we're going to hear from uh, Larry Peterson, also from Own Lab. He's going to talk about a different project over there. All right, thank you. So, so I am going to talk about another project that, we're, that we have at Owen Lab, and it, it intersects very nicely with ONAS. Uh, also of interest to the service providers, uh, they are in fact thinking about how they're going to build their cloud, but it, it's very clear to us that demonstrating the right way to do that is something that we have an opportunity to do on Internet too. Uh, the big takeaway is, man, you're going to build a cloud, are you crazy? Uh, Amazon, Google, they have a 10-year head start, and we're talking about an incredible amount of infrastructure. No, we're building a value-added cloud, and that's a different thing. So I will, I'll try to explain what that is in, in, in a couple of minutes. So we start with what Rob's given us, which is we have a network that we can virtualize. And we can get a slice of that network, and we can dynamically create new virtual networks on top of that. But that's just the beginning. It's really when you marry the virtual networks with the servers and, and create virtual machines that you have something interesting. So that is, in fact, a cloud. And in fact, what we're doing with this it has a name, Open Cloud, is a set of large clusters in a few places, small clusters in the internet, two pops, and clusters as well as at, in regional networks and campuses around the edge. So this is the starting point, but even that is just the beginning. That's just infrastructure. It's what you do with that that's interesting. And what you do with that is you deploy services. So it really is all about services. So we've got service one, which is a set of virtual machines distributed in place somehow across that distributed cloud. And it's connected by a virtual network of some topology that's particular to that service. And we have some service, too, that, that has its own set of virtual machines and its own virtual networks. So the key takeaway here is it's all about services. Services are instantiated in a set of virtual machines with some placement connected by a set of virtual networks of some topology. And it's not just a single virtual network, by the way. It can be many. One of the, one of the lessons or experiences that's driving this is, is trying to do something like this with a very s narrow technology uh, content distribution in carrier networks and being able to set up least privilege for well, what exactly do you need to do here and what exactly do you need to do there. Virtual networks are a very powerful abstraction that help you isolate this bit of work from that bit of work for the sake of security. So I'm going to take that picture, this picture, I'm going to flip it because I want to talk about it in a slightly different way. So what we really have is a multi-tier cloud. Yes, there are some data centers and there's lots and lots of cycles there. There, is some, there are some smaller, more modest clusters embedded in the, in the middle of the network. And there are small clusters of some sort at the edge for whatever your definition of the edge is. It could be on campus, it could be in regional networks. And it really then is a matter of, well, how do I deploy my service across that infrastructure? And the point I want to make is, this is about scaling the service to, to, to meet some user needs. Well, we understand scaling in the cloud. It's taught us in the data center, you scale by just having more virtual machines in the data center. But that's really about scaling computation. If what you want to do is scale bandwidth, aggregate bandwidth, then you put your virtual machines at the edge. And there are, in fact, applications or services for which it's a combination of virtual machines in the data center and virtual machines at the edge. Well, in fact, there's another tier to this, to this hierarchy. The, the cloud is there. It's not going away. So if you keep in mind that we're building a value-added cloud, then we're going to get value out of our Internet 2 footprint, but we're going to leverage the other stuff. There's a perfectly fine commodity, a set of commodity clouds out there. How many servers do I need in my data center? I don't know. I could put those very same VMs in into the commodity clouds if all I needed was commodity virtual machines. If I needed virtual machines connected with, with SDN, it might be a different story. But the point is, it's a combination of a lot of capacity at the, in the commodity cloud, some amount of capacity as cost benefits dictate in our Internet 2 data centers, and then capacity on out in, in these multiple tiers. So if you stand back from that, the, the important message is, one, the cloud isn't just the data center. The cloud is the data center plus the backbone plus the edge with virtualized networks and virtualized servers distributed across that entire space. Commodity clouds give us a perfectly fine and robust tier, fourth tier to that hierarchy. And it's all about value added to provide, to improve upon the commodity stuff that sits behind us by leveraging the, the footprint that Internet2 gives us, or for any other service provider, the footprint that that, that that carrier has. And so it's those virtual machines running in servers at the, in the middle of the network and at the edge of the network that are really very powerful here. They give us better responsiveness. They're closer to the edge. They give us aggregate bandwidth because it's aggregated bandwidth at the edge. You don't have to go back to the data center. There's opportunities to impose privacy at the edge if I put the cluster on my campus. 
Uh, I, can, I, can give you better, I can give you value added trust because I can spread risk across multiple backend providers. I can give you more predictability because I control the allocation at the edge. And the list goes on and on. You can, I can customize it. These are all values that I can provide above and beyond what the Commodity Cloud gives you by leveraging the infrastructure, both servers and the network of Internet 2. The key enabler for all of this is back to services. It's about composing services to build new things, but it's also about isolating services from each other for the sake of privacy. And those are in conflict with each other, but the, the key enabler is that you can do both at the same time. So it's multi-tenant, like Amazon's cloud, but I can, I can very selectively compose services to build new things. Now, there's two bits of technology here that we're building at uh, the Open Networking Lab. One is, I'm gonna broadly call service orchestration and the, and the piece of software is called XOS. It's a cloud operating system. The second is a network hypervisor and you heard Bill mention Open Vertex. I could spend a few minutes talking about those technologies and I'd love to because they're really interesting. It's, they're open source projects that go along with ONOS that, that we are not only you know, making this, the code available but we're standing up an operational version of it. But instead of doing that deep dive, I'm gonna go up and show you the value of this by giving you an example of an operational example of service composition. So my example is how to build a value-added storage service by composing some other services, in this case, a CDN, an object store, and a NoSQL database. So the idea, and the, the example here is, is a system we call Syndicate. So the CDN is a service that already exists that gives you scalable read bandwidth. I have caches distributed across the world. I can use them to scale the delivery of my data without having to go back to the object store every time for the data. And in particular, in, in terms of our pilot, we're using two different subservices. One is called Hypercache, which is the caching service, and the other is Request Router, which is a service that routes user requests to the best cache. Those are two bits of technology that we can deploy on Open Cloud. We're working in concert with, with Akamai there. Um, so that's scalable read bandwidth, but that's just a cache. You still need durability. But S3 and Glacier and Dropbox, they're all perfectly fine sources of, of durability. That's a very robust, stable system. I'm gonna add value to it by caching at the edge, but I can take advantage of those services that already exist. And it can be a set of them, by the way. It's not just one. That lets, lets me spread risk across uh, S3 and Dropbox, just in case one of them goes out of business tomorrow although that's not really well-spread risk because Dropbox is implemented on S3, but you get the idea. <laughs> and last but not least, caches can become stale because data can be written, so you have to spend a lot of time thinking about data consistency. A NoSQL database is a service provided by a lot of people, Amazon, Google, and so on, that we use to, to implement a security, the, I'm sorry, the, the consistency protocol. And so, in our particular case, we build this in Google App Engine. So I've got Hypercache, Request Router, let's just say S3 as an example, and this data consistency thing, which we call the metadata service, uh, running in Google App Engine. Those are four different services that I'm gonna compose together to build a new value-added service called Syndicate. Well, how do I use my cloud to do that? Well, here it is again, and I'm gonna use all of the layers. First of all, Hypercache, HPC, I'm gonna build a caching hierarchy. I'm gonna put some virtual machines at the edge and I'm gonna put some virtual machines for the root of the caching hierarchy in my Internet 2 data center. And by the way, uh, we have a set of nodes. They're not huge data centers. They're, you know, 1,000 cores. Uh, Cloud Lab is gonna give us additional resources that we can use for this as well. So there are smallish data centers that are available for this work. Um, so we've got a two-level hierarchy. Uh, it has its own virtual network, which I'm not showing the virtual networks here, but it is connected in a caching, uh, in a hierarchical network. Request router, I'm gonna put in the, into the backbone. I don't need a lot of them, it's mostly for the sake of high availability and, and much less so for scale. They're kind of like DNS servers, so I would put them in the same place I would put my DNS servers in the network. Uh, I'm gonna use S3 living in Amazon, and I'm gonna use put the, my metadata service in uh, the Google App Engine. So it's, a, it's an example of leveraging virtual machines, some of which are just raw virtual machines and I'm loading my software into. Some are virtual machines that have already been populated with S3 functionality, for example, and I take advantage of that. Compose it together, value provided by the Internet to footprint by having the, uh, caching at the edge, and I get durability from, from the commodity cloud. So that's, that's the essence of, of, uh, of value added. So I want to conclude with just one last slide, which is a screenshot of uh, the Open Cloud interface. This is interesting 
in that it's giving you a view of the cloud. We have multiple views, some for developers, some for operators, and so on. This is an operator view uh, showing you the deployment of Hypercache running on the Internet 2 footprint, including in Singapore, where we're starting to pilot the delivery of U.S. university content to, to Asia. Um, this is just a little uh, demonstration of when sites go hot and cold, you have the ability to spin more virtual machines up or spin virtual machines down. That's called the network function virtualization orchestration story. Um, but the, the, the point is, um, this is a cloud that we are now in beta uh, rolling out. We're going to open it up to early adopters very soon, and we're starting to deliver pilot services on it. So I think I will stop with that. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Great. Well, we're going to open it up for questions now. Great talks, guys. Hopefully, this has given all of you some inspiration and ideas for what, what can be done with, with a, a new kind of network. So if you have questions, feel free to walk up to one of the microphones. There's one in each aisle, obviously. I'll go ahead and start. Uh, we've been talking about SDN, quote unquote SDN, for a few years now. And I'm wondering, from your guys' perspective, how has that conversation changed? What, what do we, because SDN at first, it was a bit of a preliminary straw man concept. It was all about open flow. What have we learned in the last two, three years now that, that informs us as we move forward with SDN and virtualization? All right, Bill, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I, I came into this about uh, three years ago and attended my, my first ONS. Um, was amazed, actually, at the, uh, the number of people. So I, I'd come in from doing some consulting in the security area, and I'd been out of networking for a while. And networking is my passion. And it was very exciting to see so many, so many people interested in uh, what was possible with networking. But uh, it was pretty, pretty much uh, that, that people were, were just very skeptical, right? It's like, well, you know, the, lots of reasons why things couldn't get Get done. Of course, there really wasn't good hardware at that point. Um, there was still a lot of kind of what I would call play uh, controllers, and um, you know, in that time period, a lot's changed. There's real hardware now, really, really great hardware now. There's uh, a number of good platforms to be able to build upon. There is enthusiasm about what can be done. Of course, there is real life implementations. Uh, you know, at uh, Microsoft, at Google. Um, internet too, right? So I think uh, we've come a long ways. Yeah, that is, that is a bit of a difference too. It started out in kind of an academic circle, and now we have to deal with it in the real world. That's just one of the reasons I'm asking the question. Just wondering what we've learned so as it's gotten closer to the. If I could world. chime in, yeah. so I, I I actually came to the Open Networking Lab somewhat skeptical of SDN, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, kept questioning why do we need to do this? Do this, but. Uh, I had an experience in a, uh, delivering, like I was saying, content delivery software, running in virtual machines into carrier networks. And we would spend an incredible, or they would spend, and we would suffer along with them as a vendor, an incredible amount of time just configuring the network so that we could isolate the request router from the hypercache, from the management network, from the acquisition network, from the customer facing network. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was a configuration nightmare. And then you know, sort of following onto that, uh, the, 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 the carrier started to talk about network function virtualization, which was trying to do this for real in their central offices. And we put together a proof of concept with some, you know, a carrier BT, Intel, uh, HP, and we were there with, with our cache. And just the amount of headache there was in taking a very small proof of concept and getting it wired correctly so that you could, you could carry off this proof of concept it just screams, it's all about managing the network. And if I can, if I can spin up a virtual network on demand, uh, that, that's what's sold it for me. Yeah. Okay. You know, I think in terms of what's different now, I, th I think the trial or the efforts that Internet2 has, has made in terms of running this technology or essentially putting the production network on top of this technology is very important. When I go back to my campus and I have conversations with my hospital, uh, they're eager for the, the, the potential cost savings around SDN, but they're not eager for uh, taking per, uh, performance or availability hits. And oh, so I, th right. I, think, I, think, I think having this type of community, having the prototyping environment is, is really essential. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, and, and I, I know it's kind of early as far as real world de de deployments and developments go, but it, does it seem to be standing up, SDN, does it seem to be standing up to uh, 
the real world test so far uh, 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 as it moves out of that, that academic realm. Uh, have we gone far enough that we can commercially use SDN, capital S, capital S, capital N, capital S, capital D, capital N in real networks? I, I think Internet 2 has, has proven that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, they, they, they've proven stability, right? They went zero minutes of, of downtime because of the SDN uh, uh, software and protocols. Um, as far as uh, other folks using it, though, how, how, how that's what we have you've to mentioned see. you want it that's yesterday, so yeah. you, you, you're one example. But I, that's, that's, that's what we have to see. I mean, we, we've yeah. got examples now of how we think we want to use it, and you know, they sound compelling from where we sit today, uh, mm -hmm. that we get these use cases up and running and delivering value, I think, is the key. Yeah, okay. Well, what should the next steps be for SDN? Because it's hard to believe that we're, we're finished, that we're, we've got a complete technology we can just plop out there and everything will be better. What, uh, what would you like to see happen next? I'll take a shot. I'd like to yeah. see a hel healthy ecosystem of companies yeah. in this space. So, uh, you know, thinking back to, you know, when the internet evolved in the, in the, in the 90s, where there was true interoperability, uh, a, a lot of innovation around the, the interface between the companies, uh, you know, federal networks and academics can play a role. Uh, but, uh, you know, if, if this is just three carriers and, and uh, a couple technology companies, it's probably not going to be as interesting as it could be in that first scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is going to be a challenge, getting, making, sure, making sure an ecosystem develops. Right. Because everybody says they wanted all the vendors, they all say they do yeah, SDN, sure. but... Well, and keeping <laughs> that ecosystem healthy, I think a key yeah. is uh, the way we say it at Owen Lab is we true SDN, uh, that, they, that we continue to apply the, the, the pressure through open source mm -hmm. to not let this turn into a legacy preservation exercise. Okay, right. Um, I mean, there, migration is absolutely critical. Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt about that. But you have to say, you put the, the, the stake in the, the flag in the ground and say, this is where we're going. We will help you migrate there. But let's not lose sight of where we're headed. Right. And that this, the clean separation so you can have between controller data so that you can support third-party applications as controllers is a critical part of that. Um, yeah, I mean, it, keep, you know, open source, I think, is an incredibly important element of keeping this on the right path. Okay, yeah, and, and they, uh, open source has played a big role so far in SDN, and, and the, the folks heading the different projects seem to have done a very good job keeping them truly open, keeping them truly focused on developing something of worth rather than having each individual member contribute something that benefits their own company. So they, they've done a good job there. Um, I'm curious, though, on, on the other side of open source. Uh, in some ways, well, well, actually, colloquially, a lot of people are saying now that open source has basically replaced the standards process when it comes to anything SDN, anything virtualized. Uh, do, would you guys agree? I mean, that's it's a kind, good, of, a, kind yes, of a loaded that's question a good asking the, the ON Lab guys, but I'm wondering <laughs> if you agree. And it, what's the trade off there? What, what, do we, what do we lose by letting open source dictate the standards instead of regular standards dictate standards? I, I think they're pretty complementary, actually. OK. Uh, I, I think back to when uh, the IETF was, was getting started. Uh, I mean, there was a lot of emphasis on working code and working implementations and then creating the standards and writing the standards, right? right? And yeah. as time went on, it, it became, unfortunately, uh, a very heavy, heavy process and not quite as much uh, working code and, and experimentation, and I think that one of the things that open source brings is is all the brilliant minds of the world to to show working code and and things that could be done, and then the best things that filter out of that do end up finding their way in, into standards. It's back to basics. It's exactly that point. You have to have the implementations drive the standards, and not the other way around. Okay. Yeah. And, and express pro politically. Don't reinvent the ITU. <laughs> Right. Questions, folks. So you're, you're welcome to step up to the mics. You know, I arrived at 11 p.m. last night, and I saw what the bar was like, and oh my god, I can understand you all being sleepy, but uh, <laughs> right, let's start on the, the, uh, our left over there. Hi. Uh, I have seen layer two packet storms kind of dissolve networks more than once, and SDN's ability to put in a layer two connection pretty quickly seems like that could be a problem. Um, 
and I, I'm aware that AL2S doesn't do any MAC address learning today, to, to my knowledge. What about um, protecting the network from uh, packet loops? From packet loops, is that what you said? Yes, or broadcast storms that, that, uh, of a, a packet that is circulating or replicating mm -hmm. itself in the network. Do you really encounter packet loops with, with say, OpenFlow? I, I'm not, since OpenFlow no. dictates the rules of how stuff gets forwarded, I'm not sure you, you could right. come up with, with that scenario. I, I, I can well, maybe. I mean, the, the in theory answer is I now have centralized visibility into configuration. And that's where I address the, the correctness problem. Um, making that work in practice is going to take some time, I suppose. I don't actually know where the state is yeah. at the it, it, it's, a, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't want to hijack it. The, sorry, this is Eric Boyd. Um, I might suggest that we take this up at the, the technology discussion this afternoon, which oh, is sure. happening yeah. at 1.30. Um, we do have some protection mechanisms built into AL2S, but we can have a longer conversation there. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. But I think there's a general point here that and we, we talked about this as we were getting ready. You know, there, there were lessons learned in the, in the wide-scale deployment of the Internet, you know, security features that had to be added after the fact, both to, to BGP and DNS. Mm -hmm. you know, let, let's not make that same mistake again with SDN. Okay. You're, you're really big on that, not reinventing uh, right. old stuff we, with SDN. We want to make yeah. brand, brand new mistakes. Yeah, new mistakes. <laughs> new, mistakes. Yeah, new mistakes. <laughs> uh, right, right here? An observation that I have is, is that a lot of the folks in this room are network operators and are not software developers. And network operators know about operating networks and software developers know about building software, but they typically don't know anything about networks because we haven't done anything but just buy them for a long time. So my question to you guys is how do we build that ecosystem to get software developers that don't work for large network vendors to be able to do um, software development that will really cause this community to help innovate in the space. In, insist on open, vendor-neutral, northbound interfaces to ONOS for, as an example. Uh, that available interface is what enables a healthy ecosystem of application providers. So the northbound interface being the thing that the network and the SDN piece talk, uses to talk to the applications up in that layer. That right. I mean, ideally, you don't want an application developer to, ha to have to know a whole lot about the, the network, right? I mean, they know what they want to do with their application. We ought to enable them to do that through, the, uh, through those interfaces and the abstractions we use. Right? Okay, at the same time, the, I mean, that, that does bring up a really excellent point that the job of running the network is changing, isn't it? It, it, it certainly seems to require a, 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 a different set of tasks. What do, you, what, what do you guys see this job becoming um, over the next three, five years? Does it involve coding? It, does it involve new skills? It's, it's not about plumbing. It's about services and functionality. Right. Okay. I want this service. I install it. Uh, I don't have to plumb it. Right. At the, at the same time, what I say on my campus, our, our, our network is now our most important campus utility. Okay. Right. When, when, when the lights go out and the faculty are in an office with, with lights and they still, have, they still have wireless, they stay. When the network goes down, they go to Starbucks. <laughs> and and, and, and you, you, we, we need to be able to, to, to inject this innovation in a way that doesn't disrupt the production services and, and results in a, in, a, in a more highly reliable and, and, and segmented network. I mean, I think that's a challenge for our staffs right now. In many ways, we're bringing in new types of people. We're, going to have, we're emphasizing development. We're emphasizing people who understand services, not just infrastructure. OK. okay. And, and do, do you guys see any other ways that, that you can bring those networking and software sides uh, uh, together more closely? Uh, I mean, I, I, I guess in a lot of discussions, what I hear is that those are going to basically become the same person. Uh, and then we have to start asking, are we taking away jobs if we start actually doing SDN? Or you're going to well, see more teaming, right? Yeah. 
you know, I, I, I mean, I, 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 I'm a great believer in professional development and bringing people along. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're at a point in IT right now where we're seeing in, incredible automa automation, you know, service management platforms that are going to take away jobs. It's not just in IT shops, uh, throughout uh, many, many of the traditionally clerical jobs on campuses. Uh, this is a disruptive moment. Um, we've got to focus on the services and the benefit to the real end users, which in our case are our students and our faculty. Um, and, and, and we look at how we can figure the support function in the university using the tools we have then. Okay, okay. So for someone working in the networks today, would, would you recommend they, they learn coding? Is that, is that going to be necessary? You think so? That, that's kind of what I keep hearing too. I think we want to hire a lot of students out of our computer science departments with good programming skills and who understand systems. You know, I, when I talk to our students, I, I just talk about systems and, and the ability to, to look beyond whether it's a data center, you know, looking beyond just power or cooling or computational load, but to look at things as a system. Okay. So let me put a different spin on it. Yep. I mean, I, I completely uh -huh. agree that we're going to have to, there's going to be retraining that's going to be required here. Uh -huh. uh, but. It's because we've just enabled people to innovate. Right. If, you, if you look at what's driving the, car the commercial carriers to like the AT&Ts and Verizons of the world to start thinking very seriously about SDN, it's that they are in a position of having outsourced innovation to the vendors. Uh, you know, not to pick on a particular vendor, let's just call it vendor C. Uh, I need a new feature. I don't do it in-house. I, I go to vendor C to yeah. get it, and I get it 18 months later, and so does my competition. Yeah. Um, that you can create a healthy marketplace for innovation is, is I think, is, yeah. is the end game here. It's, it's to be easier to manage. There are going to be cost advantages. But I don't know if either of those alone puts you over the top. I think it's you know, from the senior VP of AT&T level view of this, it's about the ability to innovate. Okay. And I think that that's going to apply to Internet 2, hopefully helping working with universities to do the same thing. Yeah, that, that, that is something that the Internet 2 stuff can do is as people play with the network, we can find out what, what, what skills are needed, what's happening. I like your point about systems too. You brought up at breakfast that it's no longer a question of different layers or different silos inside the network. It's a systems problem. I, I like that, that way of thinking. Uh, question over here. I have a question that maybe moves the discussion a little bit further up the stack, but it does extrapolate from some points that both Steve and Larry made. Do you think that once the uh, security and privacy controls are, are built into uh, the networking layer, that that will become a business standard requirement for the compliance needs of higher education? That's a good question. It, yeah, with, with SDN, you do kind of get security built into the network. Does that become? Compliance report, does that become a, a mandatory? You know, I, I think it's a tool that we can use to, to segment. Um, I think we will use other, other tools. Um, maybe I'm just uh, old enough and I remember enough military strategy to remember something that the French built in the 1930s called the, called the Maginot Line. And, and I think with any technology, there are enough incentives right now, uh, not only for uh, bad actors, but also state, state agents uh, to continue to probe uh, weaknesses in technology. So, you know, we have an arms race, and we're going to keep. You know, we, we we need to meet the compliance regulations, but we should not be naive enough to think that uh, anything we put out there is going to stand uh, more than two to three years without an active evolution or on the security front. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, right here. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Greg Bell with ESNet. Thanks for a terrific panel so far. I have a pitch to make and then a question. Uh, the pitch, I just want to make everyone aware that Scott Schenker will be giving a talk on SDN a little bit later in the afternoon, I think at 4.15, and I twisted his arm to attend a little bit late in the, in the season, and so we didn't, I don't think we promoted that very broadly. But he'll be talking about the future of SDN. Um, and my question is, is around security, actually, a uh, slightly different um, um, uh, perspective on it. I hear a lot about security vulnerabilities with regard to SDN, and I wonder if we can think in the opposite direction about security opportunities that SDN provides, and whether um, the three of you, actually the four of you, have thought about um, opportunities for enhancing security, for making security less intrusive, for federating security systems that arise through the broad deployment of SDN. Uh, opportunities being proactive with security. 
you guys yeah. see anything? anything yeah, I, I, I think there's a huge opportunity, and I think that's yeah, the right way to look at it, uh, you know, is uh, first you've, you've got a central place, right? So that gives you lots of opportunities to watch what's going on in the network, to actually steer things to analysis uh, programs, uh, to even steer traffic into big data stores and do analysis on those stores. Um, SRI, SRI is, um, has done quite a bit of uh, security work around um, OpenFlow and SDN, uh, starting back with Fort Knox, and then they did an implementation of uh, SE Floodlight. And uh, we've, we've been working uh, with SRI as well to understand what it would mean in the, in the distributed controller like, uh, like Onos, right? And uh, you know, there's, a, there's a few surfaces to protect, and, uh, but, I, but I think because th you've got open source software that's, that's there for people to look at, you can get some of these fixed much, much more quickly. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that, that helps. All right. I think that's about our time. So uh, please join me in thanking our panel. Thanks, guys. Great. <laughs>
you see this um, earthquake situation. It's going to run this little video. Um, victims mildly hurt, badly hurt, broken buildings, people deploying. The incident commander in the yellow jacket is uh, controlling this with his uh, walkie-talkie. Uh, this person is looking for uh, people who have been hurt. Here the team is talking together and fanning out. Uh, they find somebody who's really badly hurt. They have to decide what to do, whether he should be evacuated. Um, so there's many, many, many learning lessons aside from what to do about electrical poles down, fire, and other dangers. So um, let's look at a few such examples, not in video, but just through walking through them. This is something we are always afraid of, and that can happen. Explosion in an airport, people down, and what are the kinds of things that we can teach in these simulations? Uh, first of all, we really do need, them, need to teach them how to take command, how to control the situation, how to structure the people who are going to be putting, uh, helping. So instant command training, um, medical triage, how do you take your medical skills, go out to the field, and actually rapidly decide what to do with a person, leave them, save them, evacuate them? Uh, the first time we ran uh, things like these, we found doctors and nurses so involved in working with the one patient, three other patients would die. So teaching them that triage means you get out and move the patients along. Transportation. There are many different considerations for how you transport patients. Somebody with a chest problem cannot be taken up in an airplane, maybe a helicopter or an ambulance. And so working out what to do, what to send with them, what instructions to send is part of transportation. Um, and you know, there's always the media. You need to know what the message is, how to talk with the media, how to have the media help the situation, not exacerbate it. Um, much that can be done there. Another example, somewhat different. Now, here we're looking at a pandemic, uh, as we are all very afraid of right now. Uh, and how do hospitals, institutions prepare for this kind of expected surge of not just real patients, but all kinds of people who think they may be sick? So simulations are incredibly useful for working on logistics. Do I have the right staff in place? Do I have enough staff? As the pandemic gets larger, who do I need to bring in? Do I have space? Do I have equipment? How is my ED set up? Who do I need to move out of the ED so that I can bring in more people? Uh, this is operations research. And um, something like this is actually being tried. We developed this actually for a hospital in Buffalo. This is the Erie County Medical Center ED, for anyone who knows that. And we did it exactly so that they could actually use Q theory and uh, plan their patient flows and actually try it out. So they're also working with their nurses to see how the nurses move patients through. And then there's actual medical component. OK, I need to triage this person. Do they need isolation? If they need isolation, how do I manage the contamination? Who do I communicate with? Uh, these are things that actually we're really not well trained for, and there's a, a, an immediate and dire need to train for such problems. Um, terrorism is not something in the, uh, that uh, where it happens. It's not really invaded our shores that badly yet, but we do need to prepare for all kinds. You could have a, a, a radiological bomb that goes off somewhere. Uh, certainly, you remember the Tokyo subway incident where sarin gas was released and caused uh, huge deaths, um, chemical, uh, biological hazards. And one of the things we teach is uh, that we can teach is decontamination uh, processes for many different kinds of hazards. So um, that kind of walked us through some of the danger situations we wanted to uh, teach people. How to, how to deal with. But what about really routine stuff? And here we're talking routine training of critical processes, but very simple, boring ones that you need to get out to a large number of people. And here you'll see a little example where a new uh, cleansing procedure was put out by the CDC and had to get out to 
uh, all of the dialysis nurses. And um, uh, this shows you a typical, uh, again, this is one in Atlanta, a typical dialysis clinic uh, f normally filled with patients. And these patients on dialysis come in three times a week. They are basically having machines connected to their circulatory system. You're going through the skin. The, the opportunities for infection are huge. Um, and so I'm going to show you a tiny little piece that, uh, and we, you know, these kinds of things, processes, you teach the process, but maybe you gamify it a little bit, maybe you make it a little bit more fun, um, uh, things that actually help you to learn these. So what you see here is um, this, uh, uh, it's just one nurse, one uh, patient, um, but as they approach the patient, they have to do various functions. Here, for example, you're seeing a catheter that's connected right to the blood vessels. And there are issues of cleansing, of removing the cap, of attaching syringes, uh, preparing uh, for the blood flow, connecting that to the equip dialysis equipment. The dialysis equipment itself is pretty complicated. And the number of safety functions that you have to test before you actually start the blood pump, and now you're running the blood through for two hours or so. So lots of problems. And if you have a busy clinic, um, then uh, you can have real tra uh, training needs. Let me just, uh, I'm not going to really go into in detail since I see that my time is up. Um, but I can just tell you that communication errors can kill. So here we have a, a simulation where uh, multiple nurses are in there. And the student nurse has to learn how to work, how to talk with the patient. In this case, they're learning how to ask about pain. So we will not run that video. So I'm going to skip through. And um, just uh, to summarize, virtual simulation is about experiences. It's about allowing people to practice safely. Almost any experience can be trained in a virtual environment. And the kinds of technologies you use for these are um, there's a game server, something that keeps everything coordinated. There's all the data of the world. There's specific content, like in our case, patient physiology models. If they have an infection or trauma, there are different physiology models. We have voice servers. Let me tell you, voice servers are a huge problem because voice does not easily go through the firewalls of hospitals. Um, and uh, many, many other services that have to be provided. Um, so just to show you Unity, SmartFox, TeamSpeak Voice, various database services, web services, test flight for mobile device testing, all of the uh, management of the projects and um, firewalls. So I thank you very much. Uh, and it's been a pleasure to talk with you. That's great. Thank you. Okay, so um, it's time to go eat. Um, but before we do that, first, thank you, Parvati. That was, uh, was awesome. Um, so uh, a couple of reminders, one, um, to join us at the community showcase upstairs, uh, and the red chair is not here, um, to have a seat in the red chair and tell your story. Um, tonight, there is a new feature to the Internet 2 conference. We're having a game night. Um, it's a chance for you to go grab a drink, grab some friends and some colleagues. Um, there's a, a company that brings games into forums like this. Um, and I'm told there are games for everyone. So um, we would encourage you to come and, and, and try that out tonight, 7.30. Um, last note, uh, there, there's a technical talk um, that some of you who are interested in a little bit more on network virtualization can meet with the whole team that helped develop that. I'm at 1.30 back here, and I would um, echo Greg's comments. Scott Shanker is an awesome speaker, and his talk, at, um, I believe it's at 5? 4.15 here again. Um, is he, he, he's worth um, worth hearing his talk. So thank you all, um, and have a great day.